You are listening to the True Objective Podcast. Carlos Morales and Objectivist Girl, Lauren Rumpler. Dispelling myths about our society. Hey guys, and welcome to the True Objective Podcast. Uh, you are on with Lauren Rumpler of Objectivist Girl and... Carlos Morales of Truth Over Comfort. So what we kind of wanted to discuss today is, well, Memorial Day, right? Because today is the day to remember the troops. Oh, yeah. Now, kind of the only rational approach to the conversation that I can find in light of the atrocities that have occurred throughout history. In fact, we don't even need to go out throughout history. Rather, we only need to look at the last two great wars perpetuated by the United States, i.e. Afghanistan and Iraq, which led to millions of death. The only rational view from understanding that is that as peaceful individuals, we must take an anti-war stance. A stance against violent colonialism, a stance against totalitarianism, a stance against war. Now, the normal visceral reaction after this understanding is that, though we may disagree with the political you know, uh, fights, the political facade, is that we still need to support the troops. Now, I do empathize with the individuals who have been put into the position, who have been manipulated mentally as well as economically, to believe in joining the military, right? You're told while you're a kid, you know, the troops, they're the heroes. And for that reason, hell, for that reason alone, you cannot support the troops, though, and be anti-war at the same time, because there's the important word there is choose. Supporting the troops, supporting individuals who voluntarily chose to join an army, which with just a pad, you know, just a tad bit of research has shown time and time again to be unjust, supporting them only works in the favor of those who seek to control humanity through violence. Troops are economically rewarded for murder. Then they are socially rewarded for their sacrifice, while at the same time supported by those who state that they are against war, against murder, against colonialism. I see nothing in that equation which leads to a more just, a more moral society. I have not heard many individuals state that they supported those who ran concentration camps, but were against concentration camps. Debt, taxes, and blood pay for the arms that the military used to infiltrate other countries using blood, then taxes, which then leads to more debt. So on this Memorial Day, I call out to all the rational brothers and sisters to remember the victims of war, and in order to best do that, you know, in a second here, I think we should go through some of the statistics in regards to our lovely wars. Oh, yeah, I would love to hear some of these statistics. I mean, guys, it will just gross you out how many people have died. Now... After Saudis may or may not have taken over some planes, right? They, they took over some planes on 9-11. They went ahead and rammed them into some towers and immediately died, right? And as a result of this, they started the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, right? Iraq war started a little bit, a little bit later. This resulted in ten th- tens of thousands of innocent individuals dying in Afghanistan for something that they had no moral responsibility for as an extension of the war on terror, the war on nouns and verbs, the war on tactics. And over a million were killed in Iraq. Actually, if you go and delve a bit more into the Iraq war, economically within the United States, the Democrats on the Joint Economic Committee estimated a $3.5 trillion cost through 2017. Say the war will cost the average U.S. family $46,000, and many of those people are themselves being paid for by the government. doesn't exactly work out economically, right? Now, you think about that huge economic cost, but then you could think about the fact that physically there are 18 suicides a day by U.S. troops and 320,000 U.S. vets have brain injury deaths up till just 2011. Now, in Iraq, there are 2.8 million Iraqis displaced. That's one in 10, and 80% of those are women and young children. And again, 1.5 million dead. The odds that the father has been killed in the war in Iraq is 1 in 11. The odds that an Iraqi son has been exposed to a traumatic event in the past two years, 1 in 2. And then, of course, there's whole parts of Iraq which have been completely irradiated and no longer, well, no one's going to be able to live there for quite a fucking while. So if you go ahead and put all those together and then you go down Manchester Street, Elm Street, which was just going on earlier today, where you have a bunch of fucking paid murderers walking down the street with their goddamn flags going, look, support us! I know. We're using your stolen money to fucking kill brown people. Aren't we awesome? Yeah, uh, I will say it right now. I absolutely do not support the troops. I think if you sign up to kill individuals, I don't support that, and I don't want to pay for you to go around and kill people from other countries just because they're from other countries. What do you think, Calvin? We have Calvin uh, on our show. Uh, well, uh, I, I, 
first off, don't support the troops one little bit. Uh, I could see the point of a, a memorial di type thing if instead of uh, celebrating our militarism, it was more of a, hey, we just killed a shit ton of innocent people this last year. How can we uh, not do that in the future? If it was more of a day of contemplation, I think I could be a lot more on board than I uh, am right now. I mean, my heart goes out to these people who are uh, ultimately brainwashed and becoming cons of the state, but uh, on the other hand, if you uh, don't raise any opposition to that philosophy, uh, you are, in essence, supporting it. No, you are. Yeah, you absolutely are supporting it. Whenever you state, absolutely. you know, with these ridiculous things, uh, like I support the troops. You know, I know the wars are bad, but you know, they 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 are out there. They're dying for our freedoms, mind you. After every single fucking war, more of our own freedoms uh, freedoms are actually impeded upon every single time. You get oh, yeah. a whole new cascade of laws, which then destroy people's civil civil liberties completely. And then they go, look what we just did for your freedom. Oh, look at all the nice things we're doing for other people. We're setting them up with a wonderful government and so that they can run themselves. And we're going in. It's basically Keynesian theory. They're going in to destroy the country so that they can repair it. Yeah, and, and, and that, that kind and of that, destruction. And that's it. I mean, that's what Keynes stood for. He said, why don't we go to war so that we can repair the countries afterwards and that'll bring in income. It's fake. It's false. It's a Broken facade. fallacy. Broken. Absolutely. So, and, you, what do you think? Oh, well, like I said, it's a broken window fallacy. It's it just, is. You know, creating or just dis destroying in order to create more. It, it really doesn't equate. Mm -hmm. Um. As far as uh, uh, I, I guess as as far as you know, what I support, if I were to have an opinion on this matter and everything, like I don't, I'm not going to necessarily say I support or don't support. You know, like what I don't support are bad actions you know like i it, an action is what makes up the person you know like that's how we judge people you know so i i personally you know if people are going out and they're enlisting in a in a military that's going to go in and kill people around the world i don't really want anything to do with it and to <laughs> you know to go out on a Monday, nice Monday, you know, like today, and, and see all this kind of worshipping of these tyrants. That's kind of disgusting. Well, yeah, I mean, and right. we have the worshipping of the fucking tyrants uh, every single five, you know, let's go ahead and take out your uh, your dollar bill. Right. What is that? It's a dead slave owner. Yep. That's what's on the fucking bill. Even if it's, even if the person was put on during a time after slavery, guess what? They were still our dictators. There were still people who use stolen money in order to kill other individuals. Right. But remember, there are heroes. There are founding fathers. And They're the ones who are respect. there to... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and respect is always a funny word, because respect is one of those things where it's never quite earned. You know, generally, whenever someone's constantly reminding you to respect them, that's them make it, basically making the statement... Uh, I haven't earned it yet, so I have to enforce it now. Right. I need you. I need to tell you to go ahead and respect me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I posted a quote on my wall today that I think it's a, it's really important to go over. Is um, Ayn Rand, who is who wrote Objectivism, and I always say that I promote Objectivism, not Randism, because some of her personal views were wrong. And just to prove that some of her personal views were wrong, she was someone that supported minarchy, and then she said this. If nuclear weapons are a dreadful threat and mankind cannot afford a war any longer, then mankind cannot afford statism any longer. Let no man of goodwill take it upon his conscience to advocate the rules of force outside or inside his own country. Let all of those who are actually concerned with peace, those who do love man and do care about her survival, realize that if war is ever to be outlawed, it is the use of force that has to be outlawed. Happy Memorial Day. Let's end the state. Seriously, guys, I mean, if you want any further proof that objectivism is an anarchist philosophy, that's it. And I think she's totally dead on about the war comment as well. Well, no, and the thing is just because a person... Okay, so her, her writings weren't exactly perfectly consistent or anything else, but a lot of her epistemology and basic understanding of things like virtue, morality, etc., pretty consistent outside of, of course, her views in regards to the state. But... but Moreover, in regards to that, what I've been shocked by, I guess I should be shocked by, is because of that little incident in regards to the state, assholes like Leonard Pykoff can then come out and state categorically that Ayn Rand would be fine with us blowing up motherfuckers in Iraq. Right, he supported the, the war in Iraq. For the power of Israel. No, because he's, he's Israeli-backed, right? 
He, he had the exact same motives as George Bush did, as so many other bankers did, and a number of other groups, which is to back Israel. So, again, he's just using supposedly uh, this, this wonderful facade of objectivism in his particular case in order to justify the destruction and will of other individuals under this, this illusion that the state is somehow beneficial. And, of course, he's using that in, in his own forms to manipulate that in general. And so, you know, and that to me is just absolutely uh, disgusting. And anyone that supports war supports the broken window fallacy. It is never right to fix a problem with destruction, ever. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, pretty soon here we're going to be talking to individuals actually in the, in the military that I'd, I'd kind of like to get his, uh, his views on this. Uh, but, you know, the broken window fallacy pretty much means this. Back down again, and they took the an enormous the public works program known as World War II to bring the economy out of the What is the broken window fallacy? It all starts when a hooligan decides to throw a brick through the local baker's window. The community gathers at the bakery to discuss what has happened. I feel bad for that poor baker. He's lost a window. It's true, but if you stop and think about it, maybe it's not all that bad. After all, the baker does have to repair his window, which means the glazier will now have work to do. After getting paid, the glazier will probably spend his new income on some of your crops. Then you'll have income to spend on even more goods and services. Biscuits and gravy! The hooligan has actually stimulated the economy. Imagine how many more jobs would have been created if the hooligan had done more damage. Have you all lost your minds? Huh? Haven't you read Frederick Bastiat or Henry Hazlitt? Uh, you're only focusing on what's a scene. Uh, the money I will uh, spend repairing the broken window, uh, or why you will ignore uh, what's a unseen. Uh, the money I would have uh, spent on a new suit. The tailor would have also spent his new income on some some of your crops. A farmer giving you more income to spend on other goods and services. The only difference is that I would have had both my window and a new suit, uh, whereas now uh, I only have a window. This hooligan has cost our community a new suit. The story of the hooligan shows us that physical damage destroys wealth. After all, if the hooligan's act actually did stimulate the economy, then society would have been better off if he had destroyed the sign, the building, and the rest of the town. But the broken window fallacy is much more prevalent than it may first seem. In fact, it remains at the core of mainstream policymaking. For example, when the government claims to create jobs by financing public works programs, such as construction, it does so at the expense of its citizens in the form of either higher taxes or inflation. The citizens would have spent their tax dollars on other goods and services, like refrigerators or surfboards or movie tickets, which would have increased job growth in those industries. Because these goods will never be produced, however, these potential jobs remain unseen. But they are no less real and no less important as the jobs that we do see. So if you ever hear of the stimulative effects of wartime spending, tariffs, or stimulus bills, know that this is merely our old friend, the broken window fallacy, dressed in new clothing and grown fat beyond recognition. It's basically the, the sort of argument I got from uh, teachers when I was growing up going to public government schools, you know, teachers telling me, oh, well, you know, war is a terrible thing, but you know what, it, it made, a, made a lot of people rich. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I get that. Falsely rich. Yeah. It's well, yeah. all a facade. I mean, this money could be going into new technology to create new things and new ideas and better people's lives. Right. Yeah. I, I, say, I say screw war. But war is an old school way 
of doing things. We need to do things in a much more intelligent fashion. And I say war is the old school way of doing things. And, uh, Calvin, did you have anything else you wanted to uh, comment in uh, regards to this? Well, uh, kind of underlying what Lauren was saying, uh, you know, as much as I uh, hate excessive uh, government programs, uh, we could have just about every other government program you could conceive of if we weren't killing so many motherfuckers across uh, the world. Uh, you know, how much of the uh, U.S. budget goes into uh, military and military-related activities? Seems like at least 40%. I was yeah. 10.5 yes. billion per month, at least, as far uh, as that was up to 2011. That's massive. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And the thing is, is that's that's uh, what's funny is that in the U.S. military budget, that doesn't also include contractors. So right. Well, it doesn't so, matter because they can just print more money, right? Well, no, I know, <laughs> but it's it's still fun exercise in your mind here. So what what they did was so after the Iraq, uh, so Obama was like, look, we're going to be pulling people out of uh, Iraq, right? Yeah, it looks like pulling, this big savior. You know, looks, if you look, they actually <laughs> did. They brought in two hundred thousand military contractors. Yep. <laughs> and the Congress didn't actually have to have to spend any money. Or, or as in, uh, as in, basically state that that was the moral or just thing to do. Of course, I would never trust the fuck fucking Congress to ever tell me uh, what the moral thing to do is. I mean, or like, even the truth. Yeah, <laughs> for that matter, as, as a whole. And you know, when you're trying to kind of put and and mold together this idea of what it means to remember our follow, uh, fellow brothers and sisters, the saddest thing, because what, what's really occurring here is whenever you tell someone I don't support the troops, what you're stating is, is that you know, you are un-American, you are unpatriotic. And what they're really stating, though, is you are not buying into the collective delusion that we all decided to buy into as a result of propaganda by our great leaders, as well as propaganda that was brought into us through public education that led to us with these dogmatic thoughts to where we right. thought it was completely rational for one group of individuals to take money from another group of individuals. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to give that to some other group of individuals who would then train and brainwash another group of individuals, give them money, uh, and give them arms, then throw them into another country so they can blow up other people. And guess what? If any of those blown up people, if some people remain and they're mad, those are called insurgents. They're going to continue to blow the fuck out of every single one of them. That's the war, folks! <laughs> Good job! Brought to you by USA uh, uh, and Geico. I don't know. <laughs> and it's your corporate <laughs> companies. And it's going to ensure, you know, blowback in a most likely scenario as a result of that. You know, like 9-11 uh, was a, a blowback scenario. I was sure inside job is coming out of your mouth. <laughs> oh, I didn't say anything about inside job. I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, like if... if uh, Every United time somebody States says 9-11 military... was a... I... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it doesn't really matter how it you do, It does not okay, matter. So the, the reason why I, I'm kind of on the point of I don't really fucking care if it's a government matter. conspiracy is right. because I'm in the, same the government killed one point what one point two to one point five million people in Iraq, right? And that apparently had nothing to do with nine eleven at all. <laughs> like even even the even the uh, uh, the associated categorized uh, conspiracy that they decided to sell to us because nine eleven by their own admissions is itself a conspiracy. A group of uh, Evil Muslims uh, got together and goes, we're gonna fucking take over a plane with box cutters. Yeah, with oh. box cutters. And what was what was amazing to me is like, so after 9/11, people like uh, Rudy Giuliani were coming out, and people are like, wow, Rudy Giuliani acted so courageous during this. I was like, wait a moment, didn't he fail? <laughs> didn't the defense fail? Didn't George Bush fail? Right. Why is everyone applauding them now? Right. Because they weren't able to stop any of this. At no point did anyone ask why are you guys so off course. Why are your planes so off course? On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, 
hitting the Pentagon in the Budget Analyst Office, where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of the incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. So there's an interesting article by uh, Thomas De Lorenzo, a historical revisionist who's done a lot of work in regards to uh, the Civil War. And it was called, uh, instead, let's see, some anti-Memorial Day remembrance. There have been one or two exceptions in American history, but in general what Americans are mem memorializing on Memorial Day, which began as Decoration Day shortly after Lincoln's War, it's wars of conquest, imperialism, mass murder of foreigners, and the confiscation of their property, the abolition of civil liberties at home, the slavery of military conscription, and the debt, taxes, and inflation that are used to pay for it all. The state orchestrates never-ending memorials to itself and its wars because war is the health of the state, and in almost all cases, the deadly enemy of freedom and prosperity. The American Revolution was a just war, as Murray Rothbard explained in his essay, Just War. Uh, okay. What do you, what do you, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. What do you think, Calvin? 
Oh, wait. Well, I, just let me get a bit more through here real oh, quick. Oh, okay. Uh, but barely 30 years later, the American stage began its long imperialistic exodus by attempting to conquer Canada during the War of 1812. The attempt failed, and Americans were burned a burden with a huge war debt, inflation, and the resurrection of the corrupt Bank of the United States, a precursor of the Fed. The War of 1812 was sold by warhawks like Henry Clay under various false and absurd pretenses, such as Clay's insistence that the British were encouraging Indians to attack Americans. No matter how absurd the state's lies are, they've always been an easy and ex expeditious way to dupe boobus Americanus into supporting its wars. Well, that is a hell of a lot of alliteration just in the kind of way of being able to explain any of that. I'll go <laughs> more into that in a bit here, but I want to go ahead and get a bit more of Calvin's thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like what you guys were saying before. Uh, the, the problem with war, uh, even just war, is how many innocent people have to lay down and die for you to have your just cause, for you to have your uh, blood vengeance in the case of um, you know, the recent wars that uh, this country has partaken in. I, I think one lesson that uh, people uh, very quickly forget uh, is even in the case of uh, seemingly just wars, uh, they have a tendency to precipitate uh, nastier violence later on. I, I've heard a very um, convincing argument from several people had the U.S. not entered uh, World War I, uh, World War II would not have happened, uh, essentially because uh, they were able to strong-arm uh, really harsh treaties towards the Germans at the end of World War I, which in turn led to the rise of fascism in the first place. What people have to realize is you need to pull out and stop, or else, uh, no matter how just your causes are, uh, you're going to inevitably perpetuate violence. Does that make sense? Well, I, absolutely, and if you just think about as far as the Treaty of Versailles is concerned, cr creating a lot of... Uh, issues with that. Actually, Thomas De Lorenzo captures a bit more of this um, in regards to what you were stating. World War I was none of America's business either, but Woodrow Wilson used the excuse of the sinking of the British pleasure boat, Le, the Lusitania? Lusitania. Thank Lus you, sir. Lusitania. Uh, which yeah. carried 100 American tourists to enter the war. He knew that the pleasure boat was secretly transporting arms to England and refused to warn the American tourists of the danger. One effect of Wilson's war was to strengthen the hands of the communists in Russia and the Nazis in Germany, as Jim Powell pers persuasively argues in the book Wilson's War. Without American participation in World War I, Powell argues, there may have never been a World War II as the Europeans Boom. eventually settled their own differences as they had been doing for hundreds of years. And um, what's his name? Brett Vanatz, uh uh, did a did a series called The American Way that really started to kind of break down the parallels between the United States lead up to the Big Brother that we have right now and 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 as far as like World War Two and everything else is that's concerned. Uh, trying to state categorically that this wouldn't have occurred if this didn't happen is a bit too much speculation for me. I mean, we can kind of go into different ideas in regards to the development of these wars, but. The only way war can really occur is with the state, and that's kind of the more important takeoff from there. So, I got into, I got involved in like, I wanted to see, you know, the corollaries of how the Bolshevik Revolution started, where uh, in regards to Lenin and everything else, and then New York Stock Exchange and a number of other banks funding Bolshevik, uh, Bolshevik Jews, who then kind of created a bit of chaos, Russia and everything else. And I was looking all into, I was like, ooh, what's a little conspiracy here? What's a little conspiracy here? And then I'm like, well, none of this could have really occurred without Federal Reserve type of system, along with the state in general. So trying to go, oh, well, if this one thing didn't happen, this one thing wouldn't happen. It's fun. It's sexy game. You know, it's like, great, this is a good time. But, but it's it never might, ending. But it, but it is a bit uh, never ending as far as that's concerned. Now, Calvin has it coming, apparently. Uh, well, uh, yeah, again, going off of that, uh, you were saying earlier that uh, war is the health of the state. Well, the lesson to take away from that uh, in this uh, particular field is that totalitarian states win wars. Uh, any push towards a uh, successful war effort is uh, naturally going to be a uh, push towards totalitarianism because that's the only way that uh, a state can really be successful in any military enterprise. Uh, it's a fairly simple lesson that uh, I guess a lot of folks just don't want to understand. Yeah. Okay, so we have James back in. Let's hope his audio is working. Is it working? Yeah. Yes, it is. Hi, okay. James. Hello. So okay. hopefully my computer doesn't crash this time. I, I hope so, too. So um, I wanted you on the show because I kind of wanted to talk to you uh, regarding... So I, I wrote up this thing essentially stating that to support the troops and be anti-war, right? Okay. Uh, it's kind of like being... supporting rapists and being anti-rape. 
And I kind of wanted your views in regards to kind of that idea and the idea of supporting the troops as a whole as you are uh, yourself an actual veteran. Correct. Um, well, it's a, I guess it's an interesting analogy. Um, <laughs> uh, so, well, see, there's, I guess it's more complicated than that because um, if you go philosophically as to what soldiers are supposed to do, it's, a, it's slightly less abhorrent as a, a rapist, so to speak. Um, because, you know, in theory, soldiers could do some good things. Do you agree with that or not? As individuals, I would think so. Yeah, I, I, I think, though, if soldiers are doing good things, generally they're not soldiers. Uh, can you go ahead and explain that a bit more? Right, well, I mean, uh, so the fact is, is that um, it's a massive generalization to just assume that uh, as all soldiers are bad, correct? Uh, now, what soldiers do is obviously not morally uh, justified in most cases. Um, obviously it takes a lot of uh, experience to figure that out sometimes and some people don't, so to speak, figure that out. So to equate, uh, let's say, troops with rapists, I, seems, I seem to think that's a little extreme. Um, However, I, I mean, I understand your point is, is, is that... Analogy. What I'm stating, though, is that war is incapable of occurring if you don't have the soldiers there. If, if you don't have troops, Hitler is staring at a wall and just yelling. Nothing's actually going to occur. It takes the soldiers there for something to actually happen. Right. But uh, most soldiers, I think, they don't... They, they're either not really given the entire... Um, truth as to why they're joining the military or they're being forced into the military because um, when it comes to many wars, uh, obviously not the American ones so much, but a lot of the troops, um, if you want to go to say Nazis or you know the Vietnamese, uh, they really didn't have a choice. It was, it was either they joined their military or they themselves would probably be killed. It's sort of a pragmatic place to be sometimes. Okay, but what about U.S. military soldiers? Specifically kind of now. I mean, they're not the... forced. There's no draft. No, there's they not. They're signing up to kill, and they know they are signing up to kill. Uh, they... Not necessarily. Yeah. They could be signing up to be a cook or a clerk. Yep. But that's supporting the efforts to kill. Yes, that's true. Right. So I say they are all in the wrong well, I think um, if I may jump in, I ahead. think uh, what uh, James was was alluding to before is that, you know, like the yeah the soldier the soldier wears a uniform, and he is the soldier she is the soldier, and then on the other hand they are still a human with their own ideas and and their own orders like you know um, they're ordering themselves for instance as individuals, uh, I think they. You know they can turn a new leaf. They can do you know um, beautiful things as an individual, as somebody who's you know this the human skin underneath the uniform. I know, but to say support the troops is to say to support the troops, not individuals who have individual minds and hearts that will hopefully see the right way, leave the military as soon as they can and do good things in the world. I don't want to support people that stick with the military. Oh, I agree. And and the same thing goes for, like, for instance, LEAP, um, law enforcement against prohibition. You know, these are people who say, well, we don't like this. You know, like, for instance, corrections officers in jails or even police officers, you know, they say, well, we don't like what's happening, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and say that we are for liberty or something, you know, but really they're not doing much about it. Um, uh, James, how do you feel when someone says something like, I support the troops, or when you see something stating something like that? Well, it's a complicated issue because um, the reality is that most people, I don't think, put any real thought into it. It's just like it's one of those things that you uh, you say because it's sort of in our culture. You know, if, if you want to be the person that's um, on the so-called right side, uh, the popular side, you say things like support the troops. Um but the, for me, uh, support the troops, um, I would hope, would mean that you support helping out the individual that possibly joined the military um, at a young age, you know, not really understanding the entirety of what they're getting into. Because there are there is a lot of uh, uh, sort of obfuscation as to what the reality is of when you're joining the military. Uh, I joined the military before there was a war. However, I did know that that was a possibility. Um, and... 
the sad truth is is that most kids I think join up because they just feel like they have nothing else um, on offer you know they the economy is not that great they've got to get college money maybe or they just want to get away from their hometown a lot of poor people join the military and um, unfortunately uh, there's not a lot of truth out there as to what the negatives are for the military because you know there, there's a massive ad campaign um, for the military there's there's a huge budget that's pro-military and trying to encourage kids and you know there's recruiters in the schools and all that stuff yeah so saying support the troops um, in my mind means that you are you're supporting um, these individuals that um, are sort of in a pitiable situation right that they might not entirely know what they got themselves into and now you're sort of stuck because there are a lot of negative consequences um, you know, there's a lot of brave souls out there that just do get out of the military um, and face a lot of consequences in life afterwards, but they're really not that bad. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, that's that's kind of how I feel about that phrase. But I, if, Unless the if, person is, is actually is, bad. Is, well, if they're, right, but I would never collectivize was... the troops as a bunch of bad people. I think that, first of all, there there are bad people, and then there are other people that have made mistakes, but I'm not going to sit around saying that I support the troops and support their bad decision. Yeah, so that's the problem with the statement is that it's a massive generalization. That, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you, you know, you could say support the cops, but we know that there's a lot of bad cops out there too. So it's, it's just, I, you know, generalizations like that are just meaningless feel-goods that uh, sort of, uh, you know, when people like uh, put out like, let's pray for... Darfur or something like that, or they put up uh, signs that say "Bring our girls back" for the situation that happened in Africa. It's just some sort of nonsense that people throw oh out there, God. and they're trying to throw online. It means nothing. Whenever you take into effect also the fact that Obama basically directly funded the people who took out those girls out of the schools and everything else, it was it was Al Qaeda and stuff like that. So wow. Obama was directly funding these people, and then there's this great campaign. And uh, it reminds me kind of of Coney 2012, Did you Coney see, 2012 uh, which was like Coney hadn't been seen for a couple of years. And it was obviously like, you know, military was just like, oh, yeah, we can go somewhere else. And people like, you know, you had sexy people like George Clooney saying, we have to do something. And we have to do something is generally always what's stated whenever you got a catastrophic law that's about to occur. You know, the, the introduction of child protective services was simply there's child abuse. We have to do something. <laughs> there's people there's people somewhere else something bad is occurring we have to do something and that's always followed by blood because that's all kind of the government knows how to do right. it's either create bureaucracies or or um, do violent actions but in both cases they are backed uh, by and, violence and to to James's his point earlier you know the indoctrination is very very legitimate and he has and there is truth to that I, I find it a bit harder to believe now, I guess, in the age of the Internet as far as being able to legitimately be able to research whether or not the military is a good idea. Um, but, I mean, certainly, you know, say, hell, even back in 1995, um, you know, you go to school and they have these things where it's like, oh, you're a real man? Why don't you do some pull-ups for the, for the Marines? Look, you can do one of our choices. Here you go. Look, this is a great cool way to travel. Man. This is a, way, a great way to do this. This is a great way to do that. And whenever you grow up in a situation like public school where you're always told what is right and wrong based off of the dictates and whims of some arbitrary authority figures like teachers, principals, or parents, or preachers, or politicians, a lot of Ps, love the alliteration. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you, there is no autodidactism. There is no self-learning whatsoever. I just think it's harder for me to buy into giving that much empathy to individuals because, okay, so... For instance, there uh, there was uh, I I wrote up some status up. They were running troops, everything else. And someone goes, well, you know, most of these people are eighteen to twenty one. They don't know anything else. And she's basically stating that just patronizing soldiers, basically going like giving them no sense of responsibility whatsoever. Well, guess what? The dead kids th that that were caused by these troops, well, they didn't have a choice either. So it's hard for me to to empathize with that in that level. And it's just kind of a it's a battle as far as trying to understand it. And I do have a gut reaction to whenever someone says, like, I support the troops. It's it's like that picture. There's a picture with uh, Jesus holding an army's uh, army uh, sniper's shoulder, and it says, uh, a great job. That kid didn't see it coming. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that today. Oh, by the way, what you were saying, Carlos, about people saying we have to do something, those are the people that never have any intention of doing anything. They have no ideas and no thoughts on the issue. They just want to seem sympathetic to the idea. I don't know. I don't buy that because... I no, mean, the, they really have no intention of doing well, anything. Well, there is the... I, I, just had a, I just had a discussion with... Otherwise, they'd with, have a suggestion. Well, if you hold up real quick, I just had a discussion with a woman who was passing a law regarding bullying that I've talked about on the show before, and her whole fucking point was, well, we have to do something, so we got to pass this law. And she's getting it passed from California that's going to make stating fa Facebook comments, making a bad Facebook comment, is a misdemeanor crime if you're under 18 that's a fine $100 on top of the kid. Okay? So the adult has to pay the $100. Now, her main argument was, we have to do something. Mind you, this woman, I had known her for a while. We did a bunch of anti-child protective services stuff together. She's well aware of the fact that every single time you say, Child's welfare is important, therefore we have to do something, therefore get the government involved, therefore kidnap kids. You know, this is what it leads to. So there are people who state we have to do something, and that something is blood. Well, I was talking about the people that say simply we just have to do something, and then they don't follow it up with anything. The people that follow it up with we should get the state involved normally go and try and pass legislation. But the other thing that I was going to ask you, Carlos, is have you actually, do you, have, have you guys seen this picture going around of Michelle Obama holding the uh, send back our kids thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, they're directly trying to get involved in both sides of it. Oh, fuck yeah, they do it all the time. I mean... It's a it's, big thing. It's, it's a, a circus. It's, it's huge. It's sleight of hand. I mean, Come guys, seriously, them. don't be... Don't be confused by this stuff. It's just a bunch of sleight of hand. It's a magic trick. And we have Mr. Wes Bertrand uh, on the line from Complete Liberty. I wanted to get kind of your thoughts in regards to this. Hi, Wes. Hey, y'all. How's it going? Can you hear me okay? Pretty good. We can hear you. <laughs> okay, I'm on a 4G connection, driving in a car, actually, as a passenger. Um, Fair enough. So, yeah, it reminded me of the, uh, the book by Zimbardo, Philip Zimbardo. You know, he did the Stanford Prison Experiment, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he talked about um, not just bad apples, not just bad apple barrels, but bad apple barrel makers. And I guess you could see the system of government as this bad apple barrel maker, essentially. It's a power over domination institution. And it's just no wonder that we have all of this coercion and blood that comes out of it. You're breaking up a bit, buddy. Of our family system. There you go. And you're good. Keep going. Okay, he's breaking and up a little bit. And your connection sucks, but uh, I will state though. Um, I mean, to your to your cr credit on that, bringing up the Zimbardo thing does remind me of um, you know when I talk about child protective services, uh, what's constantly brought up to me, you know, my past with them and everything else is, well, this is just a few bad apples, right? Well, the tree from which they came, the root of it is evil, right? Which is the financial incentives, it's it's the economic dependency, it's the theft, it's the violence, it's everything which led up to those apples coming out, right? So it, it is it is the tree from which uh, they, they fell in regards to that, and Calvin had a statement to make in regards to this. Uh, yeah, hearing all this uh, brings back a uh, phrase uh, that I'm going to paraphrase from my evangelical upbringings. I always used to hear, uh, hate the sin, not the sinner. Uh, I, I would say, hate the state, not the statist. Hate the player, uh, not the yeah. I, I bear no ill will against uh, members yeah. of the military. Uh, I am willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that most of them are willing to do, or trying to do the right thing. Uh, but uh, what most people don't seem to understand when they say support the troops is, uh, first off, I do try to support the troops by educating them. But uh, education, uh, especially philosophical and social education, often comes with uh, first admitting hard and unpleasant truths. Uh, and I, I just uh, yeah. think that too many people don't perceive any middle ground between um, basically being honest with the troops and uh, just absolutely hating their guts. Absolutely, hey, uh, I totally agree, Calvin. James, um, when you were in the military, did you find that people were, um, what, what was it basically people stated why they were there? Like, why did they join up? College money. Yeah. That's they almost got me. Pretty much solely, it's, it's like I said before, it's um, to get yeah. college money, to get out of your hometown, or to have a job because where you live, um, there's no employment. They also almost got me, so... Yeah, it's it's um it's very uh well thought out and marketed and you know they're good at what they do at sucking young people into signing away a pretty good portion of their early life. Um, 
literally sometimes, obviously, you know. Uh, so, yeah, Calvin, like what he was saying is, you know, uh, support the troops and the war is a very good phrase to have, um, I think. You know, that makes sense because if you really did want, you know, care about people, then you would want to educate the people on both sides. As, you know, there is no benefit to war. War is a racket, as they say. Um, so. Yeah. No, well, the thing is, though, is like, if you were to say support the troops, though, and the war, then the troops would be out of a job. Oh. So maybe support humanity and the war. Carlos, have yeah. you ever had a conversation with um, a uh, military guy that was trying to recruit you? Uh, ooh, you trying seemed, to recruit. You seemed surprised. Oh, okay. I thought I thought you them. were just gonna say, have I ever talked to a military person? I was no, like, no, I no. That was trying to recruit. I've been yeah. around in America for a while. No, 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 no. Uh, who was trying to recruit me? You know, I off the top of my head, and no, because in high school, by the time I was recruiting age, like you know, like oh, okay. seventeen, I was fucking fat, so they didn't want me anyway. <laughs> it was like three hundred twenty pounds. They're like that nigga cannot do a single pull up. <laughs> Dude, so they're they're a lot like the Mormons, like. If you've ever had a conversation with a Mormon, they're just really friendly and like they really wrote, like they make you feel like they're your best buddy, and they just they just want to help you. Yeah. They just want to make your life better. <laughs> what were the, th what were the uh, James? What were some of the things that were stated to you before you ended up entering in and joining? Uh, basically just the benefits of getting a uh, college money, uh, getting a. Li a little life experience, uh, you know, I talked to a recruiter about what I was, you know, the reason that I was interested in the military, uh, so for me it was about uh, what I thought would be job experience when I got out uh, doing aircraft maintenance, which it turned out I didn't really care for it that much, uh, you know, college money, which is, you know, it's a decent amount, but not a whole lot, because obviously the uh, price of college has skyrocketed uh, 14 years later from when I first signed up. Um, so, you know, just just the kind of kind of usual platitudes about, you know, get out of your hometown, learn to be a man, you know, see the world, shoot brown people, stuff like that. <laughs> that is always an exciting one. Yeah, I had a, I remember one of my, well, I, he really became an acquaintance after he stated this. Uh, he, I, was, <laughs> I was in, uh, I was just getting out of high school and I was talking to him and he was saying, uh, yeah, man, I'm joining the fucking military. I was like, okay, cool stuff. I was like, well, why do you want to do that? He goes, dude. I'm so down for blowing up some of those people. They're bad people. We got to blow. Them. Like he said, the words "blow up," and he actually worked in demolition. Generalizing so all those people. Those people, though. Wow. And so, and they've done an incredibly great job of uh, propagating and manipulating the masses in order to kind of back these things. Oh, brainwashing at its finest. Although, to be fair, one of the great, like, recent wins, I guess, for the public in general, uh, was we didn't end up going to Syria, and a lot of that had to do with blowback by the public. There was like, come on, man. You just you just told us the weapons of mass destruction thing for Iraq, and we didn't buy that one, you know. And they were oh fuck, I guess we got to back off for a little bit. Well, man, I'll tell you what, that was probably a big moment for me when I decided not to leave America because they actually wised up. I did not think they were gonna wise up. I did not see that coming. Absolutely. I couldn't believe they didn't just support it. Were you ever uh, looking into joining the military there? Yeah, there were a couple times. Um, I actually, I I went to a four-year college and uh, for film actually, and I was uh, originally I had gone in for industrial design and I wanted to do the CAD designs and 3D printing and all that kind of stuff. And I uh, three months into it, I said I didn't want to do this anymore. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't like it. I, even though I was going to a private school. Uh, it seems still very much structured in a way of a uh, public school and, and you know, I'm just following a program. I didn't like it. I wanted to get out and see things, see adventure. That was one of the things that was most appealing about the military. Yeah. Of course, uh, you know, my, my parents were pushing me to keep me in college and everything. They wanted me to stay. And, um, but a couple times, that was my escape. That's what I was going to try and do. I was going to be like, well, you know what? I'll just go ahead and join the military, and after I'm done or even while I'm in there, I can go ahead and keep going to school and get my degree, um, and I'll get it paid for, and I won't have to struggle so much. You know, for me, uh, I just was at my uh, – I was trying – I was looking for a, a school, and, of course, they had the whole setup with, uh, you know, checking out the schools, but they also had – the army there, mm. 
Mm-hmm. And so the army was like, if you can do this number of push-ups, we'll give you this. And I'd been a swimmer for eight years. So I could do one arm push-ups. And they were like, I walked up to him and, you know, I look like little because, you know, I'm a swimmer, so I'm, I'm lean muscle and I don't look like I'm like a powerhouse. And so I walk up and they're like, okay, well, you can do girl push-ups. And I'm like, no, how about I do one arm push-ups and I do twice as many as you just said. So I got down, I did the push-ups because, you know, I like to brag because I work, I worked really hard as a swimmer. So I got down, I did um, all these one arm push-ups. And uh, they were like, you need to join the military. And they kept talking to my dad. Like, they kept walking around with my dad. Like, my dad was going to make this decision for me. Yeah. And my dad's like, no. No. <laughs> no. You take my daughter, and we're going to have a fight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, so Calvin's stating here that he was considering the military as well. Ooh. Well, sort of. Uh, I've never been uh, too keen on the idea of killing people for no apparent reason. So I was actually thinking about the Coast Guard. <laughs> Coast Guard. Nice. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's got all the same programs and everything, except you don't have to go overseas terribly much. You might have to shoot up some drug dealers on occasion, but, you know, eh. But uh, actually what really killed uh, the idea for me was uh, about the time I was uh, getting ready to leave high school, uh, there was this uh, movie about the Coast Guard uh, where they did all this uh, rescuing people from really awful freezing cold water up in Alaska, and I thought, wow, that really looks awful. And so, uh, you know, that, that kind of turned me away from the whole idea. <laughs> you were turned away, not because of the killing, but because of the cold water. Yep. I'm glad you weren't a swimmer, Calvin. You would have really hated it. Well, yep. you know, actually, back when I was a super status, and like I said, I was about to join the military, <laughs> I had I'd gotten to a point where, you know, I was studying things like liberty and whatnot, but I was just getting into it. And I was about to make the... Uh, justification for joining that well it's just a just a contract thing i don't agree with you know i'm not a part of this like i was actually going to make that justification in my mind i'm oh. really ashamed of it um but yeah i mean we all come from somewhere though good job <laughs> so, for not doing it man good and, job um uh, james uh have do you keep in uh contact with any of your former uh you know people that you used to work with when you were in the military and do they know of any of your kind of free state related things? Oh yes, um, I, I keep in contact with probably a dozen or so of my uh, former army buddies, and there's a couple of them that definitely know uh, this crazy free stater thing that I'm doing. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple guys that are uh, kind of more more into it and more interested in it than uh, the others, so to speak. But uh, I mean, there are some other guys that are. Definitely, they understand the whole concepts, but they have families and jobs and stuff like that, so they probably wouldn't ever do anything more than just sort of have a vague interest in this liberty thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, although when it comes to the military thing, I always thought it was funny. I believe it was Ron Paul got the most amount of military funding from the from the soldiers. That's, that's so. To, yeah. That's so great. I he, thought that was that was pretty interesting. So I, you know, well, of course. Honest, honestly, after talking to James, who is also known as Puke from Puke and the Gang. PukeandTheGang.com. Great website. Yes, thank you. Um, he, uh, uh, honestly, after just having a conversation with him, I, 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 I'm already softening my stance a bit as far as how aggravated I was earlier because I, I, I do have <laughs> to keep in consideration the fact that, yeah, these people are manipulated for a long period of time. And for me to immediately shit on them and call them all a bunch of fucking murderers probably is not the best tact, especially when I talk about things like nonviolent communication. Probably not the best best move, honestly. But still, yeah, because it's—I mean—it is a form of uh, generalization and stereotyping. You know, I mean, we all do it, but uh, you have yeah, to you... remember that that everybody has their own lives, and and there are definitely some bad soldiers out there, and some are not that bad. So, you definitely softened me a little bit too. So, yeah, yeah you, you you won over the True Objective podcast. So good job. So, so it's definitely. Well, Thanks, thanks for being uh, on, and and Calvin, thanks also for being on. Uh, Puke, yeah, I did thanks. get your website correct, right? <laughs> yes, sir, you did. Pukeinthegang.com, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and uh, hopefully somebody else gets some uh, a little insight out of this as well. Absolutely. And uh, Bew is also doing a film. You want to tell us about your film, Bew? Uh, uh, well, yeah, my name is Bo. And... Bo. <laughs> it's you okay. do that every time. Not a problem. I like, I kinda way like... cool, cooler than Bew. Uh, <laughs> Bew's actually Bew's a lady's kind of name. awesome. But anyway, go ahead. I think it could be either, actually. Um, funny, actually, I was named after a dog, the family dog. 
Uh, <laughs> Big Bo. They said you have to, to join the military, though, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Bo is a really good name for a fucking soldier. <laughs> Um, well, no, I, I um, what I'm here, uh, like, uh, one thing I'd like to promote, if, if possible, is the uh, the film that we're producing called uh, 101 Reasons uh, Liberty Lives in New Hampshire. And uh, so the idea is we'd like to showcase uh, all the great features of New Hampshire as a place to find liberty in your lifetime. And uh, so o- over the next few months and up until November when we're planning our, our early release, um, we uh, will be filming and putting up pre-release videos and trying to gain traffic and get people involved and get people uh, seeing the content. So. And I think you're going to be doing uh, an interview with Objectivist Girl That's for right. that, that film, huh? Yeah, it was supposed to be today, but we rescheduled uh, for Wednesday. And uh, actually, over the next couple of days here in Manchester and Concord, we should have about uh, 10 or so interviews. So definitely excited for that. And uh, so, folks, um, make sure to check out the, uh, the True Objective. Actually, you can do it as podcast form if you... Uh, go to truthovercomfort.net. You can find that. We're on Stitcher now, and Stitcher is way better than iTunes because iTunes sucks a fat dick. Um, so go ahead and check that out through that. Um, of course, always subscribe to the YouTube show. And, um, yeah, if you guys ever want to join us uh, for any of our shows or anything else, just go ahead and send a message to us on Facebook, or there's a lot of other venues you can check out through the website. And uh, thanks for everyone who was on the show today.